Good morning, everyone. Can uh, you hear me? Show of hands. Okay, who isn't here yet? I don't see Ruth. Is Ruth here? Phil? Phil's here. Uh, there's Gord. Uh, Barb? I don't have a full screen, so I can't. All right, do you have a power cord today? Derek is here. Ken Becking. I would imagine Ken, you're. So the picture when, when it has their name on it, does that mean they're present? Yeah, down the right participants. Can you down the right? Anyone in there is here. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. See that that's that's a good indicator of. Uh, I don't worry so much about images as I think the back. Right. Oh, okay. So um, we're missing the mayor. No, he's there. No, the mayor's there. He's the one in the blue I don't shirt. see him on the. You're mi you're missing Ruth. Oh, okay, good. Okay, so it would appear, other than Ruth Nishikawa, am I right? Do we see Ruth anywhere? Anyone? No, I have a letter into the. No, it's not even a letter. I'll call her. So it's uh, nine o'clock. Do we do we do we wait? We can start just as long as we can start. Would you like? Would you like? Nine. Okay. Of ten. So we have a quorum. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I think we have all the technical. Challenges addressed and dealt with. So good morning. I'd like to call this meeting uh, to order Wednesday, July 15th. Our general and finance committee meeting of the township of Muskoka Lakes. It is 9.01. And I'll first read uh, a commentary that this electronic meeting is being held in accordance with section 238 of the Municipal Act 2001 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'm going to verbally confirm here that I do believe everyone uh, is here except for Ruth, Nish Councillor Nishikawa. And so we'll await her presence, but uh, we'll continue on. Uh, all of the senior management team is, is, is here, the CAO, the clerk and other members of that team are present. Uh, but the public input uh, for this meeting for this July 15th agenda was invited at, the, at our email address, TML public comment at muskokalakes.ca. And we have not received any uh, commentary to that regard. Uh, a couple of uh, housekeeping issues for motions. The motions uh, have been pre-populated with random movers and seconders to expedite the meeting unless they are a notice of motion. In terms of voting, members shall physically raise their hand until the chair has confirmed the vote. If the vote is unclear, a verbal vote shall be recorded by the clerk. This is not considered a recorded vote. And of course, we all know how to use the blue raise hand Zoom feature and ensure you unmute. So with that, I would, uh, Acknowledge that uh, there is no supplementary agenda for today's meeting. And I would ask uh, any member of this committee if there is any pecuniary interest to disclose at this time. Having none, um, I'll indicate that there are no invited delegations today. And um, that just prior to introducing our Director of Public Works, uh, Ken Becking, I would like to introduce uh, someone new and of course, the Director of Financial Services, uh, Mark Donaldson. Uh, welcome, Mark, uh, to our Zoom call and certainly to our corporation, to the Township of Muskoka Lakes. Mark comes to us from the Treasury Board at the province, well qualified. He's met a few of us already and has reached out to others to schedule uh, meetings, uh, introductory meetings. Just over three weeks in his role, he has 
as reports on our, uh, as well as council agenda with a view to moving the finance portfolio forward. So I want you to join me, of course, in waving to Mark and welcoming Mark to this township. Uh, we look forward to involving and engaging with Mark. So uh, our first report, 5A, is a report from uh, our Director of Public Works, Ken Becking, as it relates to Curry Street, uh, Bala Parking, and I, and I think perhaps even on a more fulsome sense, a larger scale of parking in the township. So I'll hand it over to uh, Ken Becking. Ken? Uh, good morning, council, or committee rather. Um, as the uh, chair has alluded to, um, staff uh, attempted to carry out the direction of council uh, as a result of a report that you uh, dealt with back in September of last year and then further uh, providing uh, fin financial resources to carry out in uh, the budget. Um, was considerable amount of resistance from the local uh, residents with respect to uh, the intended works. Um, staff put a pause on things until we could uh, sort of try and uh, ascertain what the, uh, the issues were. Um, Essentially, the residents are not in favor of additional on-street parking, which was the was the recommended solution. Um, and uh, contrary to that position, the island residents are not in favor of, of not having some form of additional parking. So they we're in, we're in a bit of a, a juxtaposition. Um, at this point, the committee can recommend one of two things. You can either uh, carry forward with the solution as was previously approved uh, by committee and council or uh, adopt a, a, a different approach, which would be to sit down with the, with the stakeholders and uh, the ward councillors and try and hammer out a solution. Um, this is part of a, of a broader uh, issue with respect to parking throughout the township. Um, you'll recall that we, we've had a number of problems with our, our old uh, parking bylaw, uh, bylaw uh, uh, 6791 or 9167. Um, and we attempted to update that last year. Unfortunately, there were some problems uh, that were experienced with the bylaw and uh, that has given us, uh, I guess, an opportunity to, to take a pause and, um, and uh, revisit that bylaw. And we hope to bring that forward to you next month if uh, all things going well. Um, in the meantime, uh, I think uh, probably the best approach is the, is the recommendation which is to try and sit down with uh, the stakeholders and come to a solution that uh, everyone can live with in the meantime the old bylaw still holds sway in other words 90 uh, 9167 is still um, in force uh, which includes the status quo situation at curry street so it won't make the situation any better but it certainly won't make it any worse than it currently is uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, okay, committee, thoughts, observations, comments? Okay, Councillor Mazan. Uh, and thank you, it's through you, and perhaps directed at the Ward A Council. Um, do you feel that entering into dialogue that you guys will be able to fashion some kind of a, a solution? Is that achievable? Thank you. I can certainly answer that. Um, just from my perspective, I have been uh, actively involved at Curry Street and, and what, what the status quo of that right now is, is that uh, um, all parties understand where we are right now, where the township is, as per um, uh, Public Works Director Ken Becking, and where the laws are right now, and they're comfortable in a in a hold, if you will, in a pause, if you will, in a status quo for the moment, 
waiting uh, throughout the next month or two to see how this unfolds. So, you know, I think in that regard, we're in a, we're in an okay spot. Um, I don't know that we have to do much more than um, let Public Works do their uh, their due diligence, if you will, on not only Curry Street, but I do believe on most of our launch ramps, public docks, public access pieces. Uh, and I do have that commitment. I, I think we all would want that where there's consistency and clarity from um, from water access location in and around our, our township uh, seeking that consistency. So I, I'm certainly in favor of uh, uh, what has been put forward today as a Ward 8 Councilor. I can't speak for certainly for Donelda and or Ruth, but from my perspective, I know the Islanders and the cottagers, the mainland folks are completely comfortable right now in this pause, in this wait. So if that answers your question. Any other comments, thoughts? Okay, good. Well, given that, um, I do have a a resolution moved by Councillor Bridgman and seconded by Councillor Edwards, uh, be it resolved that the General Finance Committee recommend a Township Council that Ward A councillors and staff be authorized to revisit the range of alternative solutions identified in the August 15th, 2019 staff report with representatives of the Battle Park Island residents and the Curry Street residents. So I would ask all, all those in favor, if you would Show us your hands, there's Ruth. And yourself. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Carrie. Okay, that's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ken Becking. So our next order of business, item 6A, which is a report from our clerk's assistant. Uh, which is the delegation of authority to the clerk in terms of survey requirements. Um, I guess I'm going to call on Terry Guthrie. Thank you. Please, Terry. I'm just unweeding. Thank you, Chair. Um, the report before you today is to delegate authority to the clerk to allow the one year extension, sorry, the one year requirement for a survey submission um, to be extended extended during certain circumstances. Um, sometimes uh, different situations arise where um, the applicant, applicant cannot submit their survey or have only been able to provide us a draft within the year. Um, so allowing this delegation will help streamline the process. Um, the former process was that the um, the matter would come forward to committee for approval to extend the, the requirement for the survey beyond the year. Um, and this will just allow the clerk to um, do it administratively. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, thanks, Terry. Uh, I would ask any thoughts, comments from the committee? Sorry? And the, oh, sorry, the mayor, sorry. Um, thank you, uh, just a Bill, question. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, so my question to uh, Ms. Guthrie is the, oh. um, how often do we have to extend past a year? I'm wondering if we want to actually just change our bylaw to be 18 months for fulfillment or not. What's, is, is a year the right amount of time frame? Typically we can get surveys in within, um, within the year. We do actually have a couple that have come forward. Surveyors obviously haven't been working lately. So we're kind of anticipating that there might be a few. Um, so, it's not very often that we do come forward to committee um, looking for that approval, um, but every time we've done it, it, it's been recommended to extend it. Um, I think the one year mark is acceptable though. Does that answer your question, Mayor? Okay, any other thoughts? Uh, before I read this resolution. So I'll, I will proceed with that. Uh, moved by Councillor Jaglowitz, seconded by Councillor Kelly. Be it resolved that the General Finance Committee recommend to Township Council that the Municipal Clerk be delegated the authority to extend the one year deadline for the survey requirements set out in Township Council Policy C-LS-08 uh, brackets, sale of original road allowances and original shore road allowances 
and C-LS-09 sale of flooded land due to reasons acceptable to the clerk. All those in favor? Okay, that's passed unanimously, thank you. Thank you, Terry. Okay, we have a uh, report, item 6B, uh, and here is uh, Mark Donaldson, uh, Director of Financial Services regarding uh, financial reporting. Please go ahead. All right, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> so I'd like to start by thanking the members of the committee for the privilege of serving the, you and the people of uh, Skoke Lakes. I'm, I'm very happy to be here and I look forward to working with you and, and my colleagues here at the township. It's, uh, it's truly a pleasure. Uh, the attached information will report is uh, a piece of a larger initiative that the Treasury area will be working on over the coming months uh, as it relates to our annual fiscal cycle. Uh, the committee requires timely, accurate, and reliable information uh, to support its decision making and assess the township's progress on its financial objectives as set out in the approved budget. Uh, to this end, uh, staff is planning to put forth quarterly reports in accordance with the current policy. Uh, as the schedule described in the uh, in the report attached. Uh, the timing allows for sufficient uh, efforts and time to ensure that the reports contain all the relevant information needed and the explanations uh, related to those uh, items in the for the reporting period that's uh, that's included. So in conjunction with a more fulsome review, uh, staff will be bringing forth a series of new finance policies regarding budgeting, reporting and, and procurement and other items. Uh, and these policies will include a policy outlining these timeframes for regular committee reporting updates, uh, and that will be brought forward at a future meeting. So with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Good, thank you, Mark. Uh, okay, uh, committee, this is a report uh, for information purposes only. Uh, if you have any thoughts you'd like to share, please uh, do so at this time. Anyone? Good, I, I, think, I think that what we're really looking for, Mark, as much as anything in a previous discussion with you, is the timeliness piece. We, we'd like information as quickly as we can get it and be able to be uh, more proactive than reactive. So thank you for enacting some of these wonderful new processes right away. And uh, we look forward to seeing the fruits of some of that yeah. with you. Thank you for that report. Um, I'm going to move on uh, back to you again, Mark, as it relates to a uh, report on the COVID-19 pandemic property tax assistance. So uh, please proceed with your report. Yeah, thank you. So in, uh, in recognition of the financial impact to many as a result of COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, and supported by payment deferrals from the province and the district, the township passed resolution for an initial 60-day deferral period. Uh, for payments on, uh, on the 2020 interim property tax that was originally due March 27th uh, and waiving late payment fees associated with that and then further extended that for an additional period which currently is scheduled to expire on July 31st. Uh, the district has, uh, as you well know, the district has, has entered stage two of the province's reopening plan uh, in mid-June and it was recently announced that uh, Stage three will be uh, in, uh, coming uh, later this week. So as the, co as the economy reopens, uh, senior levels of government are moving towards ending some of these programs. Uh, and as well, other municipalities within the district have also approved similar periods uh, of deferral payments and they're opting to end their programs uh, as well. Um, the preliminary estimates of the costs of the deferral of the interim tax payment uh, are, is approximately $150,000, uh, which is consistent with what the initial estimates were uh, when the original resolution was tabled. Um, final costs of the waiver of the late payment charges and other COVID-19 uh, expenses will be included as an information item as well in the upcoming report uh, in August for the committee. So that's it, if there's any questions on that. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mark. Um, okay, so communications, uh, I guess I'm wondering if you as a group have any thoughts on that, any um, 
we're, you know, we're not being asked, again, it's informational only, we're not being asked to consider any extensions or anything else. Um, the program ends, am I right, it ends in August? July 31st. July 31st, sorry. So thank you for that clarity. Um, committee, any thoughts on that? Uh, Councilor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to, uh, uh, to Mr. Donaldson. Um, do you expect that $150,000 will end in deficit or are you optimistic that this could be recovered through some uh, provincial funding that might be available? So we've not received any um, formal communication or indications as to whether or not there will be um, opportunities for remedy on those costs. So uh, I think that there's uh, something that we'll certainly continue to monitor as to whether or not there will be an opportunity to recover any of those expenses. But I think in the as we uh, continue to review, as I, I'm in the midst of reviewing our June results, um, we'll certainly have a good indication as to what impact it has on the municipal budget and our ability to uh, absorb that within our existing allocations uh, as was approved by council in their budget uh, last uh, or two months ago. Thank you. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bridgman has a comment. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Donaldson, just a, a, in terms of clarity, $150,000, is that beyond what we normally would be lacking in terms of, of uh, late payers or non-payments for, for our property taxes? Just, um, I'm just curious, is that the above and beyond as a pure uh, COVID um, uh, result, I guess is what I'd say? Uh, so the 150,000 is uh, is taking an estimate of how our payment schedule um, compares to to previous uh, what I would consider to be typical periods. So if people people had been late uh, in a prior period and would have been charged, um, we would not have charged this year. So this is the amount of reduced uh, penalties that we would have collected in the current year, uh, based on an early estimate. So uh, it's it's lower lower uh, re revenue, I would guess, for the municipality that, uh, and it's strictly related just to uh, penalties around late payments on interim taxes. So it doesn't include any other uh, incremental costs that the, that the municipality may have experienced due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Good, thank you. Uh, anyone else? I don't see any hands up. Again, this is an informational, uh, uh, report, uh, and we're going to be hearing more about this clearly in um, in the month of August at our next cycle of, of meetings. So uh, thank you again for that, Mark. Um, I'm going to move on now. Then, given uh, given the agenda, into uh, community services. Uh, there's a report here from our fire chief uh, Ryan Morell relating to aerial drone program. So uh, I'd introduce the fire chief now, Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the attached report is related to remote piloted aircraft systems or, or more commonly known as drones. Uh, this is for informational purposes for this group. Uh, since 2014, uh, fire departments across North America have been, have been investigating the use of drones as a cost-effective measure to increase safety in firefighting operations. It is, uh, is very helpful to have an overhead view, especially as we deal with wildfires in this area. It's helpful to be able to see if they are fully extinguished so we can leave at an, an earlier um, at an earlier time frame. Um, RPAS are also becoming an increasing tool for all segments of society, including public safety. And since the Transport Canada regulations have come out, there are now pilot licenses and courses that we are taking in-house. Um, the RPAS is an operational tool that will be used in a variety of situations which I note in the report, uh, including but not limited to pre operational pre-planning. Uh, when we first arrive at the scene, being able to see hazards all the way around uh, the incident site and being able to monitor the progress of our firefighting efforts. And as I said before, uh, that really big piece of monitoring wildfire uh, progress and being able to see when the actual fire is extinguished and then leaving the scene. 
Um, I will point to two attachments attached to the document uh, are our operating guidelines. Uh, these are based on NFPA 2400, uh, which is a new standard that came out in 2019, which helps us organize ourselves appropriately and ensure that we're covering off all the safety pieces that uh, we need to include. Other considerations that are noted in the report are the privacy considerations, which we took our steps uh, or our way of um, looking at the situation from what uh, Los Angeles Fire Department had used. Uh, they had developed the chart that you see in the report there. And uh, we followed the same guidelines and developed our own operational guidelines to follow suit. The other thing that I will mention in the report, there's a link to how we will use the uh, imagery that is uh, captured from the drone. And I would highly suggest that uh, council click on that link uh, when you get time and you'll actually see how firefighters use that information in order to fight fire. I now stand ready for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chief Morrell. Uh, we do have a comment from our mayor. Uh, thank you. I, I think this is a great tool for fire service. Um, I'll also look to uh, Mr. Pink. I, I've been uh, lobbying for this for our planning department for many years as well to understand, uh, especially uh, the view from the canoe, looking from the water back where we take photos to fully understand properties. Is there an opportunity for us to share to whoever fire service individuals who are trained in this to be able to go out and take one or two photos of some of our planning applications without having to buy another drone for our planning department? Through you, Chair, to, uh, to Mr. Harding, uh, Your Worship, uh, yes. That was the intent of the program. Part, partially that, and uh, I could also see its use being used in uh, the public works sphere uh, inspecting our infrastructure. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hayes has a comment and then Councillor Kelly. Um, I, I know that this is before your time, but when we talked about bringing in the, um, the FLURs, there was to be one floor and then there was to be three floors and they were to be in the administrative vehicle station and perhaps a backup one needed. Exactly how many drones are you looking at purchasing? Is it just the one or is it going to be something that's going to be, um, now we need two, now we need three. Um, so I'd like to, uh, know what your plans are for that. Fire Chief. Through you, Chair, uh, I, I think if I understood the question correctly, the question is around how many, how many drones would be sufficient for our operation. Uh, currently today, we have two drones. So the two drones are highlighted in the report, Air 1 and Air 2. Uh, Air 1 is the drone that has the FLIR capability or the thermal imaging capability. Uh, the second drone is a smaller drone and it is primarily used as a practice drone, but it will be in the command vehicle. So we expect that drone to arrive to most incidents pretty early on. Uh, my experience here in Muskoka has been, uh, we have spent a considerable amount of time, uh, minutes in fact, trying to find the source of fires at times, uh, where if we could just pop a drone in the air, we could quickly look at where the smoke column is coming from and see where that is located. Uh, to answer your question, Councillor Hayes, there will only be the two drones ever uh, that I can foresee in the future. And, uh, and more to your point, uh, back to the FLIRs, all of our vehicles are adequately maintained with FLIR cameras at this time. In fact, uh, due to depreciation and costs on that technology, that's where we found the savings in order to afford these drones. Good, thank you. Uh, Councilor Kelly. Uh, thank you, um, and uh, thank you, and through you, uh, uh, good report. I think this is a good idea. I have a question. Are you aware of any uh, members of the uh, fire department who are already kind of hobbyists in this? Or are we all going to be learning how to fly these things over a cauldron of fire, uh, um, you know, for the first time? Excellent question. Thank you very much through you, Chair, to the Councillor. Um, we, uh, we don't intend to let people train at fire scenes. We have a detailed plan. Uh, some of which is highlighted in the operating guideline, but I can tell you that we are following NFPA 2400. Uh, it actually has us doing a whole whack of exercises with these drones. 
uh, some of which uh, are very challenging. I've tried a few of them myself. They're very challenging. And until you pass those courses, that's when you're allowed to use our, our equipment. All of the members of our service are going to have their basic uh, pilot's license as a minimum. And some members of our service will have advanced. Uh, for those members that have advanced, that will be only to use the drone in uh, public education events where, we're, where we potentially could be flying over people. Uh, typically when we use the drone, we won't be flying over people, which um, makes it possible to use the basic licensing requirements. Good. Um, yeah. Good. And, and second to your question, sorry, I, I just wanna ensure that I, I answer your first question. There are hobbyists within our fire service today that I've only just recently found out about and uh, I'll be looking to them to help lead the program actually. Perfect. Good. Thank you. Thank you. We have, uh, Mayor Harding has a comment. Yeah, sorry, just a supplemental question, I guess. The, um, I also understand that the recreational drone pilot cannot fly, I believe it's within three or eight kilometers of an aerodrome in an airport. Um, when you're a licensed pilot, I'm assuming you can potentially fly closer to or not, but the number of drone of aerodromes that we have around Muskoka is significant, which really limits where I know recreational pilots can actually fly. Um, is there a change when you're a licensed pilot as to where you can fly and not fly? Um, uh, you're to, through the chair to you. Um, the question, as I, as I understand it, it's about controlled zones. So the controlled zones that we have noted in the area uh, do not relate to the partial water aerodromes that are used today. So they are not uh, zones where we cannot fly the drone. The three areas that we are concerned about are in Bracebridge, there's a heliport, an airport, and there's also um, an airport that's located in Perry Sound and a heliport in Huntsville. So there's actually four controlled zones that we'd be looking for. Our primary concern when it comes to those zones, uh, everywhere else we can fly as long as we don't hear aircraft or see aircraft. As soon as we see or hear aircraft, we send the drone to the ground. Good. Can I have a supplemental, Good. if I may? Oh, please. Um, on the mapping of, uh, in particular, helipads uh, might be out of date as I'm staring at one right now across my bay. I know there's a second one um, halfway up Lake Rosso. I know that there is one uh, in and around the Marriott. Um, and I know, uh, I'm just trying to think where else there's other ones. Uh, there's one on Ferndale. I know they land their uh, helicopter specifically there. I'm sure it's it's licensed um, to be able to do so. So that's four that I know of on Lake Rosso in particular. Uh, the one directly across from me is definitely federal and registered because there's enough flights on there you can land uh, at 2 a.m. It is truly an airport and noted such. So we might want to just update our map. So through the, through the chair, if I might be able to answer that, uh, we use an app called, um, um, it's an actual app, it's called, it's for Drone Canada, it's Droning Canada, and it's actually specific to this question. Uh, so the specific control zones, I can get you the, the titles of the control zones where we're not allowed to fly, but those other control zones that you mentioned are aerodromes, but they are not controlled zone aerodromes. So I can actually point you where it indicates that in the, um, the guidelines in the manuals, uh, you, we actually have to read those manuals in order to pass the test. And then we use the, the app in order to ensure that when we're flying that day, that we're flying within the right areas. Uh, second to that, the product that we're purchasing from DGI uh, automatically listens on frequencies for the aircraft. And it also is updated on a regular basis from Transport Canada. So it actually warns you when you try to take off with your device whether or not you're in a controlled zone. But um, I understand the mayor's question. Um, and also related to that, we do send the aircraft to the ground when we see or hear the aircraft and we never fly above the uh, limit of 400 feet as per the regulation. So taking all of that into consideration, we're, we're attempting to be extremely safe with these products um, and, and we will not use them if there's aircraft in the vicinity whatsoever. Good, thank you. Um, a high level of preparation and preparedness, and certainly it speaks to 
some commentary that will be upcoming, I'm sure. But uh, uh, I know I certainly appreciate the level of sophistication and uh, and practice that goes into this. And certainly all eyes on, we need what we uh, – a maximum of security. And I do believe uh, our fire chief has uh, reinforced that today. If there's any other questions or thoughts, um, if not, we'll move on to um, – his uh, second report for information only, which is the Emergency Services Annual Activity Report for the year 2019. So, Fire Chief uh, Morell, you've got the floor. Thank you, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, as, as everybody, ha I'm sure, has had time to read this report, I will just highlight a few points within the report. Um, the report attached uh, represents our annual activity for the calendar year of 2019. I apologize for its tardiness. Um, as most uh, counselors are aware, we were taken aback with COVID-19 and because of our, our, uh, our meeting arrangement, we didn't want to uh, put a lot of things on the schedule earlier than now, but we actually have this information prepared and ready. Uh, I, I intend to put this out annually in February going forward. Um, as you review the uh, report in front of you, uh, please note a few statistics that uh, I think are interesting for our area. Uh, our township fire department operates 10 individual fire stations as seven fire districts. Um, we also provide all these services through volunteer firefighters, which uh, usually is an interesting point when you're talking to some of the seasonal residents. They see our members as quite professional and often confuse that they are full-time. Uh, the current authorized strength of our fire department is 155 members divided amongst those stations. Uh, we only have 119 currently in the service today, which leaves vacancies throughout the service. Um, this is notable and it's mostly due to the fact that uh, a volunteer firefighter is hard to find these days. Um, a lot of uh, attendance has dropped over the past 30, 30 years due to the level of training that we've had to put people through. Uh, certain factors like the amount of time that people have and the dual income uh, lifestyle that we've become accustomed to. Inside of our business, uh, we operate 24 heavy fire apparatus uh, with 14 support vehicles. Uh, we also have three administrative vehicles, six off-road vehicles and four marine vessels. Uh, this year, uh, we have taken delivery of a command unit and last year in 2019, we took delivery of a new pumper tanker. Uh, we continue to plan for apparatus replacement to ensure that we are maintaining our accreditation with uh, tanker shuttle accreditation and as well as fire underwriters. And based on the current apparatus age, this represents a purchase of one vehicle per annum in our heavy fleet. Uh, during 2019, there were some considerable efforts that were made uh, with our public education. Uh, we have provided 18 public education events reaching 2,587 people and we intend on reporting on that on a regular basis. We also gave away smoke alarms and CO alarms, and I'll have better statistics next year to reflect how we're doing on that front. Below statistics uh, in reaching our targeted audiences, uh, when I arrived in June of last year, we upped our ante in terms of how we use social media. Uh, we have now participated in 2019. We put out 362 total posts our average reach on a post on Facebook is 482 persons. On Twitter, we have put out 223 posts and our average reach is 1,890 persons. And a lot of uh, the information that we put out there, as you can see in a chart, is itemized for, councils, uh, for council to look at. And this is mainly so that you understand that we are constantly changing our messaging to keep it relevant and interesting for uh, the ratepayer, and also to keep uh, public education in front of our people at all times. Fire inspections are a big part of our program. Uh, in 2019, we completed over 65 total inspections, uh, 59 of which were routine inspections. 107 site visits are a part of those inspections, and 51 enforcement orders were issued to gain compliance. As for emergency responses, it was another typical year. Uh, we had emergency responses that totaled out to 580 emergency incidents uh, compared to 602 for 2018 and 582 for 2017. So relatively the same, uh, pretty consistent. 
a particular note, the fire loss for 2019 was 5.7 million. And a number that we are now tracking more heavily is what we save. So where we get that number from is what the value of the property is and actually what where we stopped the fire and how much of the property was saved. We, we, uh, we saved in 2019 approximately $8.3 million. And this is due to more people having alarm systems, uh, allowing for an earlier notification of fires and our engaged smoke alarm programming, which is getting people on the front lawn when we arrive, which is really crucial. This next uh, stat is alarming and uh, no pun intended, uh, but our average response time in the municipality is 15 minutes, 16 seconds. This is why it is very important that we have a smoke alarm program and that each and every one of us at every given opportunity are promoting it, uh, 15 minutes and 16 seconds. This time is slightly skewed due to a lot of rural responses that we go on. And anytime we have a water-based incident, those do change our uh, response times quite a bit. As you can see from the chart, you can see a grid and a pie graph there that basically outlines what kind of calls that we go on. Uh, you can also see from a map that we act, where we're actually attending all our calls. Um, I love the graph underneath it that kind of indicates where we're getting our calls in relationship to the station locations. This only indicates that basically all of our districts are actually adequately balanced. I will highlight that Milford Bay for two years running has had the lowest amount of call volume. Actually, sorry, that's three years running. Um, notable, notable fires for 2019, uh, Windermere Road. Uh, you could see that we had a fire on August 23rd. The only reason I bring this one up is on the same day, because I was, I was quite alarmed when we were putting the stats together, because I remember going to these calls. I wonder why I was tired. On the very same day, we had this another call, which was a $1.7 million loss up on Treble Road, which is at the very top end of our municipality. And it was the exact same fire department members that fought that fire. And uh, I'm just so fortunate and proud of those members for working so hard that day. Um, and then our biggest loss of the year, unfortunately, was a $2 million loss on Highway 118. Um, this, this was a, a loss that was contributed to an unusual fire spread throughout the home. Uh, our, our crews had to chase the fire throughout the void spaces in the home. Another thing I'll mention for last year was our mutual aid commitment. Um, mutual aid is obviously helping out our neighbors, our neighboring fire departments. Uh, we had a very, very huge or very large mutual aid fire uh, by what I've been told anecdotally by my, uh, by my counterparts is this is the largest mutual aid that has occurred in Muskoka. Um, we, you know, we proudly participated in that of the 16 apparatus and the 48 firefighters on scene. We contributed eight apparatus and 25 of those firefighters. And uh, I will note for council that we also had 12 trucks still in service in the township that day and 70 firefighters still available for calls. So we helped out our neighbor and we did not deplete our protection. To date, uh, this is a very important fact. 89 of our 119 members have been grandfathered through knowledge or experience or have obtained their NFPA 1001 firefighter level one and two certification. This is very important because it demonstrates that we, our people are properly trained to do the jobs that they're doing. Uh, we hired 21 recruits in 2019. This is a huge amount of people. Uh, we ran two separate programs and we ran a third program to bring people into the service that already had their certification. And that's how we ended up with 21 new people on board. Uh, we do expect that this will be an ongoing thing where we have to hire on average, about 15 to 20 people per annum in order to maintain our number. Uh, in 2019, all our legislative compliances were met for emergency management. Um, unfortunately, one thing I will note for council is that in 2019, the dwelling protection grade for the Glen Orchard Fire Station was reduced to the lowest possible grade because uh, Glen Orchard Fire Station has housed a mini pumper and currently there is no um, triple combination pumper in that hall. We have changed that setup and our plans for the future are to change it so that there is a rated pumper in that hall. As it stands right now, the pumper that's in that hall is just outside the age range of what it would count for its full credit. Uh, during 2019, just under one third of our emergency incidents were the result of false alarms. This has actually gone down, uh, but it is still alarming that a third of our incidents are false alarms. And we can attribute to the fact that uh, the drop in the number 
to the fact that uh, the fees have increased. So uh, we're hopeful that this number will continue to drop and uh, we'll have reports in the future about what we intend to do with the fees. Uh, for medical calls, the second highest call for service in, in uh, Muskoka Lakes is medical calls at 125 per annum. And anecdotally from conversations with uh, the paramedic chief, I understand that that's the highest level of medical calls for the district. So our people are, are very well used for this service and in the service is obviously well used all throughout the district of, uh, sorry, throughout the township of uh, Muskoka Lakes. Um, one thing I'll note is that uh, commitment and time constraints are often cited as the primary reasons why people leave the service. Medical calls and false alarms uh, do contribute to a lot of that commitment. There are more training hours required obviously for medical calls and false alarms tend to build complacency in our members. I just wanna highlight that point for, uh, for council just so that you understand what kind of challenges we're facing in the future and uh, where we sit today. I now stand ready for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief. And certainly before I call on uh, the hands that are up, I, I would like to add, um, I just sat and listened to your report and I didn't even hear you talk about a flood that we, some of us experienced in 2019. So, I mean, I, I think the the, the solace that the, the Township of Muskoka Lakes Fire Department provided to all those communities that were affected by the flood um, is well noted. And, and certainly I, I just, you know, it's just such another thing of it, but, um, you know, great job. And, you know, you obviously are the right person for the job to lead this group into the, into the future. So I thank you for that report. I'm going to call on the mayor and then Councillor Jagowitz and then Councillor Hayes. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, Chief, uh, for that report. Uh, just uh, one note for the rest of council to understand. I uh, received a, an email yesterday. I think uh, Chief got it from... Uh, Chief Broussard from uh, Gravenhurst, but uh, a huge thanks to our fire department who helped put out a fire or control a fire, I guess, uh, in Gravenhurst uh, a couple of days ago now. And um, just uh, very, very impressed with the way our crews interacted as a mutual aid. And I also know the same uh, as noted in your report from July last year with the Bracebridge fire. Uh, that was an unbelievably massive fire. And uh, there was another one earlier on in the day and everybody was just spent. But uh, just uh, tip of the hat, if you will, to all of our uh, volunteers for doing a great job uh, and putting, putting themselves in harm's way. You know, we had a tragic event about 10 days ago now and our volunteers have to deal with those and they're not the nicest of things that they have to deal with. So um, just uh, my personal thanks to yourself and the rest of the department as we move forward. Um, the only one sort of interesting question that as uh, you went through your report, um, just from a social media perspective, your, your biggest reach was uh, 20,000 on Facebook and 9,600 on Twitter. Can I ask what the content of that was? Um, do you know why we got so many hits and views on a particular message and uh, should we be doing more or less of those? Great question uh, through you, Chair. Uh, I believe the 20,000 reach was related to the fire, the, the large mutual aid call that we attended. Uh, we tend to do better when it's our people featured in those calls and they're not just cut and paste. Um, I rely on our people to do more messaging. We have a whole new approach uh, going moving forward where you should see our people do some of that messaging. As it stands right now, we couldn't find the Hollywood talent in our in-house, but uh, they are, they're slowly developing. And uh, through the tutelage of a great mayor that's uh, doing great video out there, we got a few people that are gonna jump up and, and gonna take, that, uh, take the reins and get more fire prevention messaging out there. Um, second, second biggest hit that we've seen when we post things has been, uh, oddly enough, the green light promotions. Anytime we do a green light promotion, it gets shared uh, wide, and I mean Ontario wide. Other fire departments uh, get onto it and they share it too. And we're not doing much other than just showing usually a picture of our signage. Uh, I think a lot of people care enough about firefighting and emergency responders, and they want to ensure that that message is promoted, especially if they're spending the weekend out at their cottage, they want to ensure that they're going to get that help they need 
because they know that those volunteers got to make the station or they got to make the call. So that's, those are been the two biggest hits that I've noticed. Good. Thank you. Um, okay. So, uh, Councilor Jagwitz has a comment. Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I have a couple of questions. The first one uh, relates to, uh, the fact that 50% of the calls last year were in two categories, medical and false, and you've addressed the false. I'd like uh, to ask a question on the medical. It would appear from the statistics that 75% of the time, our firefighters respond before the paramedics. Would that, would that indicate that uh, TML is not uh, served adequately by the paramedics? In other words, there's not stations close enough or enough to, to handle the uh, the situation would seem to me that on medical calls, the paramedics should be the first ones responding. Through, through you, Chair, if I might. Uh, we, uh, you know, obviously the preference is for the higher level responder to attend first. That's always going to be my preference as a fire chief. Uh, paramedics, that is their business. Uh, I would prefer if they do respond first, but as you can see, just due to distance and time, um, they don't. So we fill that gap. The gap isn't much though. I kind of highlight in there uh, some time frames just so that it's clear from a council perspective how often we're arriving and when we're arriving first. Uh, there are a few instances where we've had to wait uh, and that is common throughout Ontario. Uh, I experienced the same situation in a northern community. Um, so it is common that where the ambulance is tied up either in a patient transfer or in another mode that uh, fire department members are engaged. Um, for 125 calls per annum for a, for a township our size, I would say that's, 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 that's actually pretty alarming that it's that low, uh, considering the fact that due to the second home study, we think that there's about 33,000 um, extra people here for, for three months of the year. Um, to answer your question more pointedly, should we receive more service from the paramedics? I'm not in a position to make that judgment call. They have more call data that I think you would need to call upon to evaluate that appropriately. One thing we need to consider is that when they put an ambulance on the road, uh, I have been told that it costs $1 million per ambulance. That number might be exaggerated, but I, I don't think it's very far off and I think all costs considered and based on usage, um, today we can handle the medical call volume we're seeing. However, we do know that people are aging and we do know they, they call it a, a tsunami effect that is, that is coming in Ontario. And my concern is for volunteer members doing this extra workload moving forward. So I don't know if I fully answered your question. Uh, my, my concern is that if I answer in place of the paramedic service, that they could have a whole plan in place and they're just waiting for a threshold to be met, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, th 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 thank you for that answer, but uh, I, I think it would make some sense to, to look into that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I ask my second question or would you like to go to someone else? No, you can go, go ahead. Okay, uh, it has to do with, with the recent uh, uh, fire that was uh, in Gravenhurst a couple days ago. Uh, as I understand it, the property was just on the border and I happened to know the neighbor next door to it. And uh, he, he, he said something alarming to me and I was hoping you could dispel it. Uh, he uh, indicated that uh, the first um, uh, response on the scene was, was uh, 40 minutes. And that kind of shocked me. And uh, I just wondered if um, there could be any, because I see your response are averaging 15 minutes. Um, could that possibly be true or is uh, was are those facts just just not correct honestly i i cannot respond sorry through you chair um i i don't have enough information at this time to respond to that but i can get back to council with an email about the exact response time uh typically in those kind of circumstances um a person in gravenhurst picks up the phone and calls 911 the call is routed through opp OPP then dispatches Gravenhurst Fire. And then if Gravenhurst Fire, uh, or actually it goes through Aurelia to dispatch to Gravenhurst Fire, if they so determine on their chart that it's within that boundary of what we call automatic aid, which means it's in that boundary of our station responding, we have a, an agreement with them for that. 
Uh, they then call CAC, in, uh, which is uh, Communication Ambulance uh, Communication Center. Sorry. Sorry. Community Ambulance Communication Center based out of Bracebridge, and they dispatch us. So I don't think 40 minute, that doesn't sound like a reasonable amount of time. I could see it being maybe five minutes between Gravenhurst getting the call and us getting the call. Um, based on our typical response time out of that hall, it's usually between eight and 10 minutes. And considering, I, I don't know if everybody's aware what occurred at that call. Our, our vehicle arrived first. They indicated they had a fully involved structure fire. They deployed an action with a monitor off the top of the vehicle, which is really rare to have one of those on every one of our vehicles, but we do in the township and they protected the other exposures there. And I think that's all indicated on a video that uh, the homeowner had on property. So it was, a, it was a very good firefight and a very good defensive position. But um, I'll have to look into your 40 minute request there and, and get back to everybody with an email. Yes, my, my, my thing, it was not a TML call, it was a Gravenhurst call. So I wasn't indicating that TML were were, were tardy. I was indicating it was surprising Gravenhurst wasn't there sooner, but but that's fine. Thanks very much. Good, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hayes and then Councillor Nishikawa. Commentary for the Chief? Okay. Um, I did have two questions. Uh, Frank took one of them and I would encourage the uh, district councillors to look into the ambulance response. And I do have the same concerns as uh, the chief with how um, our fire department is affected by medical emergencies. Um, my question is on false calls. Uh, of the 163 false calls, do we know how many of them were called off either by um, the agency or the owner? And can we do anything that if someone is called off that they do not have to respond? Okay, through through the chair to uh, to the group. Uh, that's a that's a really I thought about that. So we typically we get a call and uh, let's say we we know that the location is a a, a culprit, uh, a common uh, a common user of the service, right? And we get a call back from that location saying that this is a false alarm. We verified that it's a false alarm. We do broadcast that over the radio waves to our people. The the thing is we've already dispatched our people. So the page has already gone out. So I guess uh, we're noting this in an in-house. There's a couple different ways that we can handle false alarms moving forward. During the daytime, we try to take on a lot of that responsibility in-house amongst our full-time members. Uh, we're thinking about at night going to what we call a call platoon where there would be people individually located in each district that would go to these false alarms that would help reduce the costs of attending a, the same event. The challenge we have in the volunteer firefighting world is what we call assembly time versus response time. So you don't have that assembly time component when you're talking about full time because they're in the building. So that's the issue. We need that time, even though it is a false alarm, we still need that time, that gap. Uh, more, more to Councillor Jagowitz's point, that 40 minute gap, that definitely should not happen. We wanna be able to assemble our people and then dispatch them from the station. So I, you know, we are looking at that. We're looking at a couple different things. One is increasing the fees, coming back to this group and, and asking for the fees to increase. And the second thing is putting on a call platoon uh, or specific officers that their only job is to respond to those false alarms so that we can get a good size up. Is it a false alarm on a common occurrence? It's very, very challenging in an area with our kind of geography to do that. Thank you. Okay, uh, just one more comment, if you would. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to thank the fire department for their expertise in um, attending medical calls. Um, I do know that one close friend wouldn't be here had it not been for the, um, the response of the fire department, so. It is uh, definitely a service that we need and we appreciate. Good, thank you. Councilor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, as the counselor on district that attends health services, I'm just gonna suggest that 
some of the information that um, was shared today is is different than what we discuss. Um, in in I've had many discussions with our our paramedics, and I would suggest that we uh, take the opportunity to look at this much closer. Um, and in fact, the council uh, could in, invite, and we, we were planning on doing this this year anyhow, but plan, plan on inviting um, the chief and, and his deputy to council or to committee to have a better understanding of, of these um, medical costs. I think that um, there's information that's missing that we're not hearing today. And I don't want to throw our um, paramedics under the bus because they do have a plan. There's a plan in place. And I think that we should be um, working within that plan. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, Okay, I'll call on Councillor Edwards, but before I do, I just want to make a comment, uh, just in, in terms of what uh, uh, Councillor Nishikawa just said, and that, that would be a question to you, uh, Fire Chief. Do you believe that there is a fulsome um, working relationship with the paramedic side of things? Which is not a loaded question. I think it's just a yes or no, really. Yes. Yeah, my experience has been, they've been very professional. It's been an excellent, relationship from all of our members they seem uh and usually it's not that that way we we're very open and we want to ensure that we're only doing the things that we're allowed to do and we want to ensure that we're working in conjunction for the care of the patient good would you say good open dialogue yeah on a regular basis yeah good excellent so i'm going to uh, call on Councillor edwards for his comment Okay, thank you very much uh, through, through the chair. I just wanted to say to the uh, chief and, and the uh, fire department, they do an excellent job, We're really proud of them. Uh, they respond quite quickly. Uh, I've been at a, a few uh, in that medical scenes where they are the first on there. They did an excellent job and uh, they should be uh, commended. Thank you very much. Good, thank, thank you. you very much. Any other comments from anyone? Okay, good. Well, that was a, oh, sorry, Councilor Mazan. Sorry, thank you. And through you, um, somewhat repeating comments already made, but I also would like to say thanks uh, to our chief. This is a very good report and I'm sure there's many things that, you know, we need clarification on, but really a very good summary of the last year. Um, two things. First of all, one is say there is the extra things and service that your team does. And uh, just on a, on a note, there was a tragedy uh, 10 days ago, and it was Chief Morrell and his team who were first on scene. And they take on an extra burden in that particular case to help the public through these types of situations as well. And I think that's the soft side that might not always be reflected in the numbers, but um, I, I think I would be remiss if I didn't say thanks from the community here for the extra service that you did in behind the scenes. So thank you to that note. Um, <clears throat> quick question. On the last part, you were talking about commitment and time constraints um, and that we will be having to recruit 15 to 22 new volunteer firefighters a year. Is that common? And I know that you highlighted that you think this is an ongoing challenge, but mm -hmm. you know, is this something that it's obviously a bit of a caution or a red flag in my mind. Uh, perhaps you could take a moment and expand on that. Um, through you, thank you for the question uh, through the chair. Uh, great question and it's going to come up in every annual report. You'll keep hearing it over and over and over again. Uh, it's no secret, the volunteer fire service in uh, North America is under threat and mainly because um, it is hard to recruit and retain qualified, well-trained, professional volunteer firefighters. And it's a big commitment. I think you'll hear about this more and more. Um, if you 
uh, if counselors attend AMO and different uh, sessions, uh, the volunteer fire service um, requires some help in the next five to 10 years. And I think there's lots that can be done at a government level to help uh, that. And uh, portions of that are how we amend the service in order to deliver the service. So that, uh, that 15 to 20 person number, uh, we, you know, we've been very open with who we get in our service. We have 119 members today. And I would say maybe three or four of them are seasonal members. And luckily, they're actually full-time firefighters in the other markets that they're in. And then when they come here, they still respond for calls with us. Uh, but that's not enough when you take the fact that 110 of those members are regular residents. To pull 110 people out of 7,000 is an incredible amount of dedication that we have in our volunteers uh, in our community. So yeah, future state, you're gonna see this in every report. And this is year two, because uh, uh, Chief Big Rig noted this in his report last year. Good, thank you. Councilor Roberts, did I answer your question, Councilor Mazan? Good, good, Councilor thank Roberts. You. Thank you, uh, and through you, Chair, to uh, Chief. Um, I, I picked up on, um, you have some ideas on how, what, what possibly municipalities could do. And I would encourage um, the CAO maybe to, um, I don't proper procedure for these ideas to come to us so we could start thinking about them. Good thought. Good thought. I'm sure uh, Fire Chief will do just that. Is your finger, your hand is still up, Gord. Is there any other thoughts you might have? No. no. Okay, good. Okay, good. So I, I think it sounds like that maybe uh, that was a very good discussion. Of course, uh, accolades all around. Uh, great job. And um, wanted to make sure that the tools are in place for the continuance of that, to that, that level of expertise. Um, I know you seem to be the kind of person as continuous improvement is on your mind. And uh, I think a lot of us appreciate that. So thank you, sir. Uh, I'm going to move on then to uh, item 7C, which is the minutes of the Public Library Board meeting held on May the 12th. I'm going to ask Councillor uh, Donelda Hayes to introduce those minutes, please, Donelda. Okay. Um, the minutes are there. I assume everyone has read them. If there's any questions, either Councillor Bridgman or myself, uh, we'd be happy to answer them. Good, thank you. Committee, any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you for that report. Thank you, we'll accept that in. Uh, I'm gonna move to item 8A, which is a report from our uh, economic development specialist, Corey Moore on additional banner requests in your agenda, pages 42 to 51. So thank you, Corey, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, committee. Uh, today's report uh, provides an overview of a request we received from the community group Muskoka Chautauqua to relocate um, some of their street banners um, to the community of Windermere. Uh, currently, we don't have any street, banger, street banners hung uh, in that community. Um, and as per the street banner policy, uh, any requests for new banner locations um, requires council approval. Um, Muskoka Chautauqua currently has uh, banners in stock that are currently hung in the township that would uh, be relocated uh, to this area. Um, and uh, as per the policy, the township uh, has the banner hardware uh, in stock to accommodate the request. Um, all costs associated with uh, installation of banners uh, in the township is approved uh, during the annual operating budget. Um, and uh, will take place uh, during the next scheduled uh, maintenance day, um, which uh, is this fall um, coming up. Uh, additionally, staff uh, took the time to review the street banner policy um, and uh, did provide some updates to it, um, which we have attached uh, as, a pen as an appendix to the report. Um, the updates include um, recognizing the, the street banner areas, um, the maintenance schedule, and uh, veteran banner areas uh, that can uh, be established upon request. Um, I'm happy to uh, answer any further questions. Good, thank you. 
Uh, do we have any uh, committee? There must be some questions and thoughts and observations on this one. Anyone? I'm saying uh, I'll, I'll go to uh, Councilman Ishikawa first. Thank you, um, Corey. I, I'm, I'm a little bit challenged when you say, you know, it, a certain groups, a certain group owns the banners. My um, recollection when this, I wouldn't say it was the first time hanging banners, but certainly when this group gathered um, and there, there were a, f a few other groups involved as well, that it was actually township grants that, that made this possible. Is that, or, or did Muskoka Chautauqua actually put out some money for um, these banners? If I may, through the chair, uh, it is my understanding uh, in discussing um, prior to the development of the street banner policy with the community groups participating in the banner program um, that they each did contribute um, funding towards the banners um, and the township was included in that as well. Okay, uh, Councillor Hayes. Thank you through you to Corey. Um, I, I would like a more clear cut idea of if the individuals own the banners, how many banners do they own? Um, and it seems strange that they wanna take seven banners out of Bala. Wouldn't it be better if they took maybe three out of Bala and four out of Port Carling or three out of Bala, three out of Port Carling and one out of Minette? It, it just seems strange to take seven banners out of one area because if they're used to being there, they will be missed. And it doesn't seem fair to take seven out of one area and put it into another. So could you comment on that? Yes, if I may, through you, Chair. Um, Muskoka should talk, but they're just recommending up to seven new banner locations uh, in Windermere. Um, the locations identified uh, in the report, three of them are uh, the uh, township's uh, decorative light posts by the waterfront, um, and then with township approvals um, along hydro poles um, from Gulf Avenue to Matthews Drive. Um, so I think in working with Chautauqua, the policy speaks that the municipality has the discretion to for banner placement, and we would work with them to make sure that, you know, there's consistency amongst the communities uh, for banners. Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much. And that through the uh, chair to uh, Corey, seven banners seems an awful lot for Windermere. And uh, I haven't talked to the hall boards or any course with the, the virus, we haven't been having any uh, meetings, but, um, uh, and maybe you, you, you can correct me. Was there some World War II uh, uh, Remembrance Day banners uh, for Windermere? And I don't want to lose all the, the, the uh, hydro poles to, to, to one organization. Uh, uh, like I say, from, uh, from from Gulf Avenue down to, to Matthews isn't a long uh, area. Probably two or three would they even do it, but uh, I'd like to maybe talk to you before we, we go and authorize seven for, for one area that may not need it. But I'm not opposed to, to, to the banners. I just would, would like the, a hall board there in, in Windermere to uh, actually have a uh, discussion on it. Thank you. Good, thank you. Uh, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, uh, first of all, going to defer to our Ward 8 councillors, but, you know, when you take seven banners out of the 19, it's almost 40% of the large banners will be removed from Bala. Doesn't that leave a big hole? So I, I agree with that. And, uh, you know, I don't mind adding new banners. Maybe we need to find somebody to add some new banners in and around Windermere area, but, uh, you know, we're just borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, so to speak, here and taking things away from Bala, which I'm not in favor of. Thank you, Mary. And I, I certainly support that commentary. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, ultimately, this could this today. I actually feel that this is also a budget discussion. And um, while we can say, well, it's nominal amounts of money, 
it is something a, a, from a bigger picture that we should be looking at uh, because there are already grants approved and different things like that. Um, but I, I will say that Bell, Bell is not a dumping ground. We're, we, are, we are important and it's not feeling that way these days. Okay, Th thank you. Corey, would you have a response? Yeah, through you, Chair. Um, I just, I do want to clarify. I know the recommendation would be for seven, up to seven banner locations in Windermere. Um, my numbers would suggest that it would be four Chautauqua banners from Bala. Um, and that as per the policy, any remaining banner spaces um, are filled by township uh, design banners. Um, so we would, uh, we would look to um, fill those remaining locations as per um, approvals through the operating budget. Yeah, thank you. So listen, you know, I do have a resolution here, but I, I, I'm not getting a warm, fuzzy feeling that I want to read it. I, I'm wondering, uh, based on the comments of the mayor, uh, Ruth Nishikawa, Gord's shaking his head, uh, Councillor Edwards has made his comments known, as has uh, Danelda. If we defer this for a month, um, under the under the auspices of, I suppose, putting it back to um, uh, back to economic development uh, in terms of uh, Corey, what what is our challenge? Reconsider, re perhaps involving the community, talk to them about that. Um, what would we, in terms of a, a pure deferment, um, what would we ask to bring forward to this committee, say next month, um, from a staff perspective? I'm not sure how we would um, would do that, but in terms of just a pure deferment, uh, you know, I think we'd, uh, we'd we'd want to have a call to action. So Mayor Harding has a comment. Uh, thank you. I see RCIO has got his hand up as well, but I think um, if timing is of an issue, that more information could come back if they wanted to get these up in the summertime in August, it could come back directly to council. Uh, but I think what needs to happen is that we need more information about which banners specifically are being removed, what specifically they're going to be replaced with, and where specifically they're going to go, and cost implications. Because uh, I will echo Councillor Nishikawa's comments that we do not want to take from Bala. We need to be building Bala. Good, thank you. Uh, okay, so the CAO, do you have a comment if you do that this would be a good time for that thank you mr chairman so i we're getting a bit of an echo here there we go uh, my my apologies uh, committee members so uh, my understanding from what i've heard from you this morning it's uh, uh the concerns appear to be related purely to the request of muskoka chautauqua um, so it would appear that uh, probably a little bit more homework is uh, is needed to um, to do a complete a fulsome review of that request and and uh, I'm sensing from uh, the chair's words that it should go back to economic development committee uh, or if there is urgency as the mayor has indicated directly to council there is another aspect of uh, the report which deals with the uh, policy updates and um, the, I'm just curious if that's something that committee wishes to uh, proceed with today. Uh, I do think that they add a, a quite a degree of clarity to uh, in comparison to what we have in place now. Um, but uh, as it relates to dealing with that portion of the report, we're in committee's hands. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in that regard, I suppose we could well, I'm going to go back to you all and ask uh, what, what are your thoughts on uh, what the CAO has just said in terms of the policy or would we just, just presume that we would bring the whole thing back in a month um, in its entirety? Any thoughts on that? Anyone? Okay, well. I so, have an idea uh, Corey, as to what Muskoka Chautauqua may want. Corey, maybe you can advise from a timing. Are we in jeopardy or anything, if I may? And uh, what's your recommendation? No. Timing isn't of, uh, of a huge priority at this time. Um, I, I spoke with Chautauqua just based on 
where we are currently in, in our, our next banner maintenance schedule day. Um, if we'd like to bring it back to the Grants and Economic Development Committee uh, for review, we can we can do that. Okay, good. So I think we'll just simply defer that to that whole piece um, and we would move on. Am I okay? I don't see anyone saying Councilor Roberts. oh sorry, Councillor Roberts Councilor. and Councillor Edwards. Um, Roberts. Thank you, uh, through you, Chair. Um, I can't see any reason why we wouldn't talk about the second part of this. If it brings clarity to the to the banners, why wouldn't we uh, discuss it? Do you, uh, fine. Do you have any thoughts? Do you have some thoughts on that at this point, or would you just want a, a discussion? Uh, I just would like a discussion on that, and um, I don't see any harm if just put this behind us if we can. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Thoughts on that? Uh, thank you, uh, and that to the chair. Um, I don't think there's a real rush on this. Uh, I know Chaka, we're doing Fun Day, which has been cancelled for this year. So uh, you know, I would like to talk to the hall boards uh, here and and just see what their views are on on some of this. I have over the, the last few years had complaints about all the signs that, that are in, in Windermere, not not uh, this type, but just, you know, speeding, uh, everything else like that. They're saying that, you know, we have a uh, real uh, proliferation of, of signs in the area. So uh, I'd like to talk to the hall board. So if, if we could uh, bring this back to an, another uh, general finance meeting, I would be fine with that. Thank you. Thank you. So just to move on, um, may, might I just have, a, I don't know, a nodding of heads or something if we would just defer the whole piece, both one and two, and then move on to something else and we'll review this next month. Is that, I'm sort of, I'm getting that sense from, from what I'm seeing. So um, with, with that, we'll uh, simply defer that for uh, next next month. I'm going to go back to uh, Corey Moore again on a report that he has on a community improvement plan. So Corey. Thank you, Your Chair. Uh, this report uh, provides an overview um, of the township's uh, successful application to the Rural Economic Development Program. Um, committee um, will recall uh, a few months ago, uh, Council approved uh, Main Street funding we received from the province uh, for upgrading community center signage. Uh, as part of those discussions, uh, there was uh, a number of other ideas identified for the downtowns. Um, and staff were directed to uh, look for funding opportunities to develop a community improvement program uh, to help prioritize um, those, uh, those ideas and potential project areas. Um, the, uh, a community improvement plan um, will identify community areas uh, in need of revitalization in the downtown cores um, and will help council uh, in developing a, a more strategic approach to capital investments um, versus an ongoing uh, ad hoc style approach uh, in relation to uh, future projects. Um, through the uh, program, we received funding uh, up to 50% of eligible costs um, in to the total amount of $51,250. The remaining uh, portion will be the responsibility of the township. Um, and it's recommended that uh, this be funded through the working capital uh, reserve that receives an annual allocation through the operating budget. Um, so today uh, we're looking for uh, authorization for the mayor and clerk to uh, sign the contribution agreement and uh, for uh, approval to uh, issue an RFP for the consulting services. Good, thank you. Committee? Uh, Councillor Hayes, did you have your hand up? Okay, Councillor Jagowitz. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to Corey. Corey, it's the reason this is being financed out of the uh, reserve fund is that it was this was not known at budget time. Uh, maybe you could just explain. Corey? Uh, yeah, yes, that's correct. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Okay, good. I've got a motion here. I'm going to read this motion. Uh, moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Hayes. Be it resolved, the General Finance Committee recommended Township Council to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute a contribution agreement, brackets CA, with the Ministry of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs uh, Ministry, as highlighted in the report entitled Community Improvement Plan and dated July 15, 2020, and that staff be authorized to issue a request for proposal on RFP for consulting services to complete the community improvement plan. So all those in favor, a show of hands. That's good, that's unanimous, thank you. Good, thank you. Okay, so Corey, thank you, stand down. I'm um, going to call on our uh, chair of Economic Development Committee, uh, Councillor Kelly, to introduce the minutes of the Economic Development and Grants Committee meeting dated January the 29th, 2020. Uh, thank you and through you. And that's a long time ago. That was six months ago, uh, back when we had to put pants on to get together for a meeting. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, if you look at it and realize six months have passed, it's amazing how different our reality is now. Um, the minutes are pretty self-explanatory. I think they're the last three or four pages in the deck that uh, accompanied the uh, agenda. <clears throat> uh, no particular highlights. Uh, we did have a meeting uh, with well-known marketing. They represented or pitched out their uh, digital Main Street offering, which we've taken to uh, our, uh, our business, uh, uh, business operators in the, uh, in the township. Uh, the only other thing that's uh, worthy of note, uh, because it was January, because we had difficulty getting enough people to reach quorum, after about an hour and 17 minutes, somebody had to leave and we had to end the meeting because we literally lost quorum. So for what it's worth, it's there, it's a good read. We have had a subsequent meeting. Uh, my recollection, it was in the last week of June uh, and uh, we will be no doubt talking about those minutes the next time we get together for general finance. Anybody have any questions? Uh, Mayor Harding has a question. Thank you. Um, more so probably to the clerk's department, whatever, as you all notice, as we try to read these minutes with the solid watermark draft as yeah. to a uh, gradation watermark draft. I'm not sure what happened when we put that together. So hopefully in the future, we don't have a solid watermark. Yeah, it sucks up a lot of ink, too. <laughs> <laughs> Quite well taken. Okay, we're going to move on. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly, uh, we're going to move on. Uh, item nine, unfinished business. Um, do, do does anyone in the committee have any comments or uh, things they'd like to say on unfinished in the unfinished business category? Okay, I see none. Uh, I have one, and and that is, if I might, um, asking our director of public works, Ken Becking. Noticing a lot of activity at the Bala Hydro plant, I would uh, be interested in knowing as an update where and what the status is of the park that they're creating on our property adjacent to the hydro plant. Very brief, if not to call, you know, just if you could provide any insight, that'd be great, Ken. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, uh, the chairman is correct. The, the um, Swift River has commenced uh, operations to uh, restore the park as part of the uh, the agreement uh, between the municipality and uh, SREL. Um, I understand. I have spoken with uh, with SREL. Uh, they indicate to me that they have retained the services of the landscape architect to implement the approved plan. Uh, they are moving forward with that. Um, I will be monitoring uh, as we progress through, uh, but the, uh, the onus is on SREL and more, more specifically on the landscape architect to ensure that uh, the works that are completed are in accordance with the approved plan. Um, if, uh, if things uh, change or if I don't see uh, what I consider to be uh, reasonable progress. Uh, I will be on, on to SREL and uh, um, demand an explanation as to why things are the way they are. 
Um, this is part of my normal duties as, as uh, your director of public works in terms of managing uh, contractual arrangements um, between contractors and the municipality. And uh, if anything looks like it's heading sideways, I will be prompt in, in uh, raising my concerns with you. Uh, but failing that, uh, we'll let SREL get on with, with uh, delivering uh, on their commitments. And uh, when staff are satisfied that they've fulfilled those obligations, we'll be back to you uh, to get your blessing on, the, on um, releasing the securities uh, that are, uh, are in place to ensure uh, performance. Good. Thank you very much for that report. Uh, Councillor Hayes has a comment. Uh, yes, through you to Mr. Becking. Um, I know that the Heritage Committee did indicate where they felt the Heritage Stone should be placed. Um, is, is this direction good enough for you or do you need someone to come in and X marks the spot? Because I think that's the only change um, that's being made to the plan. No, I think I've got sufficient direction, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, the committee was quite clear about where they wanted to see it and at the top of the hill, and we'll make sure that it gets there. Good, thank you. The, the only comment I would have, uh, Ken, again, is um, as one uh, drives by, walks by the hydro plant, um, one notices where they've just remediated the, the work that, as you say, is ongoing. Uh, there are three small signs stuck in the in the earth there, the the fill, and and it's wide open to the public. They, they, essentially, one could walk on and fall down the hill. There is no um, security fencing, if you will, which I find very interesting. I mean, it's a essentially it's a construction zone, a construction site. One would think they're working on a on a facility there. Um, would we not be looking at that from a standpoint of erecting, uh, it's, our, it's our property, some sort of a, of a security fence to keep people out at this point in time while construction goes on, or has that been discussed? I, I have, uh, Mr. Chairman, raised that, uh, that issue with uh, SREL. Um, I will remind the committee that the contractual obligations are between the contractor and SREL, not between SREL and us or the contractor and us. Um, so, um, and the contractor does need to be able to access the site in order to move equipment and materials in and out and so forth. Um, it is their responsibility. Um, there is warning signage, albeit uh, I would suggest to you that the warning signage doesn't clearly enunciate the, uh, the, uh, the risks that are posed there. But I would also point out that those risks will be present long after uh, SREL yeah. hands the, uh, the park back to us. So uh, in the grand scheme of things, I don't, I don't know that, uh, uh, that it's, it's a significant issue, but nonetheless, I have made that that comment to SREL, and uh, it's up to them to to follow up. Good. Okay. Thank you. Fair, fair enough. And and uh, thank you for that. So I'm going to move on to the new business uh, aspects now uh, under the District Municipality of Muskoka updates. I would call on uh, Councillor Edwards if you have any updates as it relates to the district. Not at this time because okay. we didn't have, have the last meeting, thank you. Okay, um, I'll call on Councillor Jaglowitz uh, for any report he may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, yes, I do have a report. Um, <clears throat> I've, I attended four district meetings since our last meeting. Unfortunately, finance and uh, corporate services is not one of them as they did not meet. However, there's one item that I would like to report on I attended, uh, and it has to do with the uh, community and planning services meeting that I attended on June 18th, and it has to do with the approval of resort uh, commercial condominium applications. As you may well be aware, since 2018, this approval authority was withdrawn from the district staff and referred to community council for greater transparency. So prior to it, 
in preparation for this meeting on June 18th, the Commissioner of Corporate of uh, Community and Public Services recommended that until such time as the new official plan policies are in place for resorts and the Marriott uh, general, uh, in particular, that the applications continue to be referred to the committee. However, at the meeting, as, as the meeting was unfolding, the district chair asked that that uh, resolution not be addressed and he tabled a revised version of that resolution. And the end result was that existing applications and those under appeal at LPAT continue to be delegated to staff. I will uh, give you an example of the concern here. And this is becoming common. And in fact, it happened at that meeting with a, with a Huntsville project, a, uh, uh, a property owner files an application for a resort condominium description. Uh, it, it goes to staff. Staff has so many days to deal with it, and make a decision. I believe it's 120, but it could be different. And that, that time period uh, uh, it, it does regularly expire. When it expires, then the uh, property owner files an appeal uh, with LPAT uh, saying that the decision wasn't made within the time frame. So under the, the motion that the committee approved, it, that application then the, would be delegated back to staff. So that means that would never have gone through committee or council and therefore it, uh, it, it lacks, lacks transparency. Um, I raised my concerns at the meeting, but that, uh, that resolution was passed and it's a recommendation that'll go to district council on Monday of next week. That's, that's my report. Uh, okay, so Councillor, thank you, Councillor Jagger. So Councillor Edwards has a, his hand up. Is there you have a comment? Thank you. I, I do apologize for that. I looked it up. I was thinking of the meeting before that. Um, and that Councillor Jagowitz was, was right on that. Also, uh, there was uh, the, the Ross uh, Mary Jane Lake application came up and it was uh, corrected at that time uh, that they was going to do, uh, instead of in two phases, three phases on that. So that was uh, corrected uh, on that. And uh, like I say, I do apologize. Uh, the, the other one was um, up in, in, in Huntsville. Uh, they they didn't put an interim control bylaw on, and somebody has taken it to the uh, the OMB or the LPAT, as it is now called, uh, because there wasn't a uh, decision. Uh, and I think it was 297 homes, and that that and they. They sort of had egg on their, their 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 face because I think they have to run something like 500 meters of services or new road, uh, water, sewer, and everything else like that. So it was deemed complete, but really there was a lot of questions and that on that. So this is this is what it was. I again I do apologize for that. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, seeing no other uh, questions or comments, I'll call on uh, Councilor Nishikawa for her district report. Thank you. Uh, I, I have nothing to report because you'll see that everything we hear about in health services is at us before we have next meeting. So that's where <laughs> we're at. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nishikawa. So I'm gonna call on the mayor, Harding, to uh, give us his report from the district. Uh, thank you. Um, and I'll give you sort of an update. Uh, we didn't have a uh, engineering and public works committee. Uh, we push some stuff directly to council when it came, nothing alarming. Um, I'll comment on two things though. Uh, the first one, we had a modernization meeting um, and the we've, we've hired a consultant that is going to help us identify and quantify our seasonal component and how many people we have uh, from a representation perspective. And, um, there's some really, really cool technology that uh, we're going to be uh, utilizing, a company called Enveronics. Um, every personal cell phone that everyone has, has a unique ID. No two of them are the same. 
And everywhere you are at any given time, your device is pinging a tower and saying where you are and, and what postal code you're in and doesn't say what you're doing, doesn't do anything else from a privacy. Um, there's a whole bunch of privacy concerns and stuff, and but that is what communications do. And when you download certain apps, you agree to certain things and you don't agree to certain things. But based on all that cell phone technology, they can map and understand where our people are coming from, where their devices go at night, are they going here during the day, are they going to work, so on and so forth. Um, and they will be able to give us an additional overlay of an anticipated uh, seasonal component in how many people are in each municipality and where they are. There's a bunch of other, I'll call it phase two opportunities with this technology that we can understand tourism components, building components, you know, are people coming into Muskoka Lakes from Bracebridge all the time um, and they're only working here? Are they working from or living in Muskoka Lakes and driving to Huntsville to work? All of that stuff uh, is really, really cool. Um, we'll be able to do a thing saying, hey, okay, of all the cell phones in Muskoka, how many of them are here on average 30 days a year? How many are on average 60 days a year? How many 180 days a year? All you can pick your parameters and we'll get a better indication of what our truly our seasonal component is and understand the movements of people and what they're doing. So that was really quite cool. That report will be coming back, uh, I think in a couple months uh, to our modernization committee because we're working forward on that. The only other thing I wanna comment on um, and I appreciate uh, those counselors in each uh, ward that have been at McDonald Road for our bin sites at uh, Parker's Marina and also at uh, Baycliff Park regarding our pilot program. And I, I wanna or underline, it is a pilot program to try and manage our way through the province's um, removal of these bin sites. We have also had subsequent conversations with the policy advisor of um, Ministry of uh, Environment, uh, Conservation and Parks regarding um, bin sites and we're trying to find some again unique Muskoka made solutions uh, we're pushing back on them potentially for some financial help to build gated fenced in areas card locks right now and again I, I just have to say they wanted all the bin sites gone they've allowed us right now there were some high risk they said these are coming out today we were able to get the weekly garbage truck it's not always in the right time it's not always anything but versus the alternative of some people for example at parker's marina having to drive 35 minutes one way to get to a transfer station to turn around to drive back it uh, is a far better solution and we're not done we're trying to evaluate this as it moves forward right now and uh, so i know there's been lots and lots of comments and everybody wants it at a different beach or a different location our district staff are literally every week getting more and more information. Um, I do know also the McDonald Road. I think we had three or four people use it first week. I think there was about uh, 12 who used it this week. One of the reasons for that is that bin in particular came out in August last year. So the public have already developed a new alternative and Tower Road Transfer Station is relatively close to that one. So it may never have high usage and we may determine that, you know what, it's totally a waste of time and energy and money. There have also been some questions and just so that all of uh, committee is aware, there was questions about why are trucks driving from Toronto and what's going on. Um, it was put out to tender for um, contractors here in Muskoka who did not want and could not handle the work. Their drivers, they only have so many, they only have so many trucks and their drivers need days off. So um, they did not want to do the business. Uh, there was a couple people from Aurelia and some other uh, people from the Barrie area. Uh, the successful bidder, uh, sometimes they would bring a truck from Barrie, but oftentimes they're coming right from Toronto. And But they also are the lowest price tender. So we're appreciative of that and more and more learning. So feel free to keep passing on public comments uh, to our Commissioner Yon and um, Director Mack at the district on this. And every week they're tweaking and changing and trying to 
deliver better customer satisfaction. And uh, the only other district update that I would uh, provide is uh, yesterday, I was uh, had the opportunity to have a meeting with uh, Minister Yakubuski and uh, who's Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and also Minister Yurik. And we are once again, bringing the issue of flooding and the Muskoka River Water Management Plan back to the foreground. Look for some uh, potential council resolutions in the next 30 days uh, as that moves forward. But uh, had some very receptive ears from the ministry as to, and some creative ideas as to how we may start to solve some of our flooding issues. That Mr. Chair would be my report. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, some commentary here. Councillor Nishikawa has her hand up. Thank you. Um, my question would be uh, to uh, the mayor. Sorry, um, could you give us, first of all, were you able to get any update on the Torrance Barrens when you talked with the ministry? Uh, and then my second question is also to ask for updates and start dates of road work. I am aware that uh, 169 through Bala um, is slated to start on August 13th. Pretty much putting a nail in any kind of effort that, that businesses have done in the area to um, uh, create business and, and in fact use their outdoor patio uh, experiences. Um, could you update us on uh, any other roads in the in the district, or excuse me, in, the, in our township that are going to be worked on over this summer? Um, certainly, um, uh, yes, you're right. I think it's August 17th right now is the date of which that work is scheduled to start. Um, and uh, I, I haven't got an update as to how long they anticipate uh, that work on 169. I know you've been in contact yourself with uh, Commissioner Yon. Um, so we can find that out. One, one of the difficulties is some of the information, it's not, as reports come to council and we look at updates, um, some of the dates and times for some of this work um, in Zoom meetings and everything else uh, I'm not making excuses, but, uh, you know, we want to put some stuff off to September, I know. But uh, when this job was awarded, I think this is uh, trying to split up some contract work. Uh, I will also make uh, added efforts to uh, advise of construction closures going forward. I know that uh, communications department at the district does a relatively good job, but they typically give you a seven day notice, not a two month notice. So what I'm happy to have is uh, the commissioner provide uh, myself or CIO for distribution to all of council with uh, what's scheduled over the next six months, if you will. Is there another question in there? Thank you. Okay. Nishikawa, Councilor Nishikawa, it's okay. you got it? Okay, so Councilor Edwards has a, a comment. Oh, sorry. My question was about the Torrance Barons. Oh, sorry, thank you. I knew there was another question in there. Um, there's a meeting on Friday at 2 p.m. Um, with uh, MPP Miller um, and uh, to try and get some uh, further clarification. It was not part of the uh, topic uh, with Minister Yurik and it wasn't appropriate to bring it up on the Zoom call. So, but we will be getting some more information with uh, our MPP on Friday. Councilor Shikawa, you still have your hand up. Thank you. Um... I'm really concerned that we are, um, I, I would say that I, I would suggest that I need other counselors backing on this, that we can't close Bala down this summer. And, in, and all the work that is slated is going to do that. And so I, I don't know if I've given you the message enough or what we can do as a municipality, but you know, this is multiple years and many have put a lot of money out to try to survive this summer, but to get it cut in half is, is a real challenge. Uh, 
Okay, I, it would be hard not to support that commentary, of course, um, as a ward aid counselor. Um, I don't know, uh, perhaps mayor, as our as our district uh, public works representative, uh, it, do we need more discussion on that? I mean, is there is there ways to defer some of the hurt that Bala could experience by road? I wouldn't say necessarily road closures, but we did. We did have that experience in the early in the spring where we got a beautiful road out of it on the other side of Bala. Um, do you have a thought on that? Um, so uh, I've actually just uh, emailed the commissioner to understand the road works on 169, how long we anticipate. One of the things I do know that we run into, yes, it's nice to say we wanna do construction when nobody's here, but you can't do construction in December and November and January, February, March. So um, we do know Highway 118 last summer where they had to replace culverts. Uh, they do individual lane closures and they try and move traffic through. Yes, it was a pain, yes, it was a problem, but some of that work has to be done in the summer. It has always been the practice of the district, especially if there was ever a full closure as we do know, um, I believe the Port Sandfield Bridge is going to be closed this fall. It has to be a full closure. There's no choice, but that would not happen in July or August, uh, obviously. Um, and my brain is alluding me as to what the actual dates are of that right now, but I know we've been trying to make people aware. Uh, it's inevitable with some construction projects, full closures, but uh, certainly anticipate no closure on Highway 169, but maybe some lane restrictions as the work is done. And I'm happy to provide when we get the information back uh, from Commissioner Yon from a timing perspective to the Ward A councillors. The only other question I would ask, and I'll go to Ward A, um, you know, there's always been a concern and, and a request to get the park rehabilitated with SREL as soon as possible. Do we want to make a phone call to SREL and say stop work and start back in October? No. Or do we want to get it done? So um, I, I look to Ward A counselors on that and uh, Director Becking, I think, can also chime in as to what we want to do. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And, and I think from my observation, it's, it's not been an obtrusive um, imposing uh, construction activity at that facility, at, that, at our park, if you will. So um, I think it's very different. I think certainly what uh, Council Nishikawa is referring to very specifically is the trauma of uh, Bala to Torrance being down a one lane in uh, the middle of August. Um, so I mean, I guess you, what you've said is you'll look into it, you'll get back to us. I think it's what we can ask of you at this point in time. So um, I'm, Ruth Nishikawa has her hand up yet again and then Gord Roberts has a comment. Sorry, I, 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 I might have left the wrong impression. My concern was not about a lane closure. My concern was about any construction happening because again, these people are trying to operate outdoors, the dust, everything else that goes along with that construction, as well as, I'll just say, I don't know coming, driving from Walker's Point that I wanna even go to Bala if there's construction. That's the bigger message. Why would people wanna drive through construction to go shop in Bala? And again, if, something was to happen mid to late September, that would make a huge difference. But in the middle of, October, of, of August, very, very challenging. And it's not just about closing one lane. Yeah, I would suggest to your, to your comment before I call on Councillor Roberts, if I, I hadn't even co contemplated this, but if there's any kind of sense that they're going to rip up Bala in front of Lakeside Bala all the way in front of Bala Bay and out the highway I would that would be a strict and hard no I mean that's, that would be the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen uh, in, in this day and age so um, so Mayor I, I wonder if we can ask can, can you come back to us with a uh, some more detail uh, at your yeah so you can sure happy to provide back information on the scope of the work the actual area of the work um, and uh, let you know what the time frame is. Good, thank you. Thank you, I'll call on Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, 
two uh, comments. First of all, the uh, garbage uh, and that pickup at uh, Parker's, it seemed to go very well the first week. I wasn't there uh, on Sunday, but I haven't had any uh, complaints at all. Yes, it's inconvenient from, from 1 to, to 2.30, but it's they're getting their, their, their garbage taken and it's, it's only a, a, a yeah, trial period. So I think it's working very well. Uh, people are adjusting to it. So that, that's the first thing. And the second one that uh, the mayor had about the cell phones being cool and that hmm. big brother is here now, that's for sure. So if you're going to the liquor store three or four times a day, leave your cell phone at home. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I'm speechless. Councillor Roberts. <laughs> uh, how do I follow that? Um, I would like to um, talk to Garbage and uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the mayor, and really to identify publicly that there is a significant, and I'm, I'm not over-exaggerating, concern with the Milford Bay community with the pilot of Garbage at uh, pickup on Sunday afternoons. Um, they are, they, Councillor Mazan and I have had numerous conversation, again, numerous, not one, not one person complaining. Um, so the, will you please take back to the commissioner in the district that the community felt that, I uh, feel that um, this is the wrong, wrong, wrong place in a very busy area and uh, Councillor Mazin and myself, and thank you. Um, Director Becking has attended there, as well as our CAO to see what was going on. I've got to say that um, the district did a wonderful job between the first week and the second week on the customer service focus. They really stepped up their game. There was an individual named Mac who did that the first day that I noticed up at um, Puts Bay and, and, and uh, they built off that from Mac's uh, lead. Uh, I can't, don't know her last name, she's with the district staff. And there's a really good, and, and the people coming and delivering garbage were greeted at the dock and they, the garbage was put in wagons and they walked up with them and they had a little chat and they got and they type of thing. So that was really encouraging. But um, they're, they're, I'm getting from, the, from the, my, my constituents in this area, that it appears to them that the district is paying lip service to them on their concerns and safety and they want something done sooner or later and finally on that in no certain terms should there be any garbage bin put in that area going forward and i know this is just a pilot but this area of the pilot i think as we're hearing loud and clear get it out of there as soon as you can thank you there. Uh, thank you. I guess, Councillor Roberts, what I would look to, uh, especially our Ward B councillors, is um, a suitable alternative at this particular point. Um, we have a number of residents who are on island properties, and uh, it's difficult for them. We need to provide solutions for their garbage. Um, this is a pilot, and I know we've talked about Dock Road, uh, our church dock. And uh, I, that is a possibility. Um, the area is not as large. The uh, boat parking is certainly not adequate at this particular point to be able to do there. Um, and uh, I, I'm, again, I'm open to ideas as we move forward, but um, help me understand, uh, I guess, some ideas, you know, and, and yes, the, the community in, uh, Milford Bay are saying no, but we're trying to provide a service for another part of our community, if that makes sense. So, Councilor Roberts has a supplemental. Thank you, Mayor. The reason for no is in one word safety. Swimming, contractors, boat launch, a business beside, a jam parking lot. It's all about safety. That's why they're saying no for no other reason. There are alternatives. And what the district needs to do is to think how it can be achieved rather than why it can't be achieved. And third, they've known that we've had this issue, they being the township and the district for a long time. They know they had to deliver bad 
news. We know we have a problem, but good change management, there's a, it's a discipline, would have helped them guide how they could have communicated better or sold the, the bad news story. And this was not done. And that's all I've got to say. Well, if I may just make a comment. Um, so unfortunately, the district is not in full control of everything. And where there was an anticipation that some of the bins we'd have four years, the ministry came down this winter and this spring and said, they are now removed in particular. And then add to that a whole COVID pandemic and trying to deal with management and opportunities and public consultation and ideas. And there's no question, uh, there was a gap in service. Um, so I, I don't disagree with your comments, but I, I will tell you that the district staff have worked around the clock on this file and are trying, you know, we're, we're talking about one bad location right now. There are 88 bin sites in all of Muskoka that we are dealing with. So um, I, I will obviously take all concerns and questions back. And if uh, we can modify some things from a safety perspective, I, I certainly understand that. District staff obviously are not gonna put any of the public in harm's way. And um, so that that's a given as well. So uh, appreciate the comments and I will make sure they are responded to district. Thank you, and I'm sure I'm sure you will. Um, I, I would like to make a comment as well, which of course last Wednesday when it was uh, a thousand degrees out and the trucks were pulled, the waste management trucks were pulled off the road, uh, Ward A. Um, I did get many calls from businesses, uh, garbage piled up for now this week. So today is the recycling day. Um, you know, I think that is abhorrent that the district didn't get on that and get a communications team all over the internet, social media, something. You know, there's just garbage lying everywhere. Everybody's calling the counselor saying, what's up? And I, you know, to find out that they pulled the trucks off the road because it was 42 degrees Celsius. I mean, I understand that, but they weren't finished with their work. And so they just, I guess it's inferred, just hang on to your garbage for a week and we'll come and get it next week. Um, that wasn't at all professional from a communications uh, piece. And so I, that is a comment I'd love you to take back to, to Bracebridge. I'm sure others would echo that. I have a, a comment from Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. I, I mostly just want to um, echo, uh, raise Nine Mile Marina as mm -hmm. a concern. Um, we're not yelling loud and clear, but it's very, very much a concern. I was there yesterday again after my fifth call in two days. Um, and I, I don't even know why that particular location has been targeted because it's nowhere near the lake or any of those other issues that are, are a concern. But I would certainly hope that um, the same concerns that are being um, shared uh, about other locations, Nine Mile is, is a big concern. It is a very, very far way for people to drive to take their garbage anywhere. True, true enough. Um, okay. Um, Can I just, if I may, uh, sure. uh, just an update. I heard from uh, Commissioner Yon, um, the stretch of Muskoka 169 that is being done is a two kilometer stretch uh, to the east, if you will, of uh, Bala uh, from Windsor Park, Sutton Drive, and basically running two kilometers along Long Lake. Um, that will be the section that is need scheduled to be done. They anticipate it taking three weeks. There's no full closures. There will be some single lane closures. Okay, I see Councilor Nishikawa's hand is still up. Um, Ruth? No, it's Sorry. Um, okay. I, I will add though, so my concern again, because I don't, I don't uh, believe that, um, I would hate to see that this goes forward because it will put three businesses in particular that just started up this year out of business. Food trucks, for instance. But again, 
I will be one of those people that will, will not travel through construction to go shopping in Bala because I've been doing it for too many years. And it's just another reason for me to, to go in the opposite direction, which is really sad. Yeah. I, I'm going to have to mirror those comments. I mean, I think it would be tragic to uh, Phil, and I don't know what to, how to say this other than just to say it. I think it'd be tragic to uh, do anything on a road, two kilometers of road that leads into a town that's been hit in the face like like Bala has for so many reasons. So, I mean, I would I would uh, beg you to to go back to public works and see if there's any way to put this off until September the 15th or yeah, you can't do it in November, December, but just to do it in the heart of summer, which is a four month summer this year, who knows what September will hold. Uh, I just think it would just be more than people could bear. So. I will be happy to provide the comments. Um, there is always an issue with uh, tendering and um, uh, work schedules. Uh, there's only so many people can do it. They're not all sitting around trying to work to our schedule specifically. Right. So, but I'm happy to provide the comment. Good, thank you very much. So Councillor Hayes has one comment and then we'll move on. Well, one final comment and uh, phase three is opening up Friday. So that's really the start of the season for most of the businesses. So they wouldn't even get a full month under their belt before the construction hits. And as Ruth said, um, coming out of Walker's Point, you turn right to go to Bally, turn left to go to Gravenhurst. Wherever there's construction, that's the way we don't go. You got it. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, uh, we don't have any closed session items. Uh, I have a resolution to adjourn. I would read this. Uh, be it resolved that this meeting adjourn at uh, 11.06. Uh, and the next regular meeting of the General Finance Committee will be held on August 12th, 2020 at 9 a.m. or at the call of the chair in the Council Chambers Municipal Office in Port Carling, Ontario. All those in favor? Good, thank you. Thank you.